Welcome back. I'm really excited to do this one. I, uh, I've been looking around for a while for a good explanation or video on how to interpret fire pump test results. You'll see on YouTube there are plenty of videos on how to conduct a fire pump test. Uh, I couldn't find very much to explain how to interpret the results of the test. And when I go out on site visits, I can't tell you how many times in the decades that I've been doing this that the the poor people on site have hired a contractor to do their fire pump tests. They come out, they make a lot of noise, they make a big mess, they hand them a bill and they say everything's okay. And then a few months later, the insurance inspection happens and the maintenance manager's all proud and he goes and gets his fire pump test results and they're crap. So, uh, you know, it, it's sad to see that the, the folks on site don't really know that the contractors are charging them a lot of money and, and not really, performing the uh, entire service that they should be. They're doing the test, but we really need the results. That's what matters. So we're gonna uh, break into it here and uh, we'll talk about how to interpret annual fire pump test results. We'll talk about uh, man-made laws like NFPA 25. We'll talk about natural laws like the pump affinity laws. We'll talk about what data gets collected how we know if the data is valid or not. We have to really make sure that, the, <laughs> that we're looking at good data. And then we'll talk about what does that data mean? How do we know that the pump is working fine? All right, where do the laws come from? Well, NFPA 25 is a uh, consensus-based standard that uh, we'll talk later at the end about how it gets developed. But basically it's there to uh, help us all figure out how to inspect, test, and maintain our water-based fire protection systems. I have been on the technical committee for NFPA 25 for decades. I've watched the standard go through many uh, revisions. Uh, I remember when uh, probabilistic risk assessment was brought into it, but uh, I've been on the committee for, for quite a while. What we're gonna do is in, in this standard, basically I'm gonna boil down how you know if your pump's running right without getting into a full-blown reading the standard to you word for word, because there are videos out there like that if you wanna have someone read you the standard. So what we're doing in a flow test is we're checking three points, right? Churn, which is no flow or basically deadhead when the pump's running and the valve's closed, no water's flowing. <laughs> And then we want to test it when water's flowing at 100% of the rated pump uh, rating, and then 150% that were overload of the pump rating. Uh, you should be able to find your pump rating on a nameplate on the pump. And I realize there are many old facilities out there who uh, don't have their nameplates any longer. And uh, we're going to have to do the best we can to find purchase orders or procurement documentation or drawings of some kind to be able to give us an idea of what that uh, rating was. Uh, you may be able to get some help with manufacturer's cut sheets. But we're gonna look at the uh, pressure and flow. And what happens is that the pressure and flow on these three points, they'll, they'll give us a curve. And uh, that curve is characteristic of the pump when the pump is new. And what we like to do with annual tests is check to see, are we still somewhere around that curve? Now I can tell you that uh, in the old days of NFPA 25, it was okay if the pump was good enough to put out the water that was necessary for the largest system demand on site. And since days gone by, that has been changed now to compare your results with the original brand new pump. So whenever your pump is more than 5% below what it was doing when it was brand new, the manufacturers think that you need to take it apart, uh, basically figure out what's going wrong, replace the impeller, do what's necessary to get it back up to 100% of what it was like brand new. Even if you might've bought a pump that was oversized by 50%. So now you're in a plant where you've got a pump that's 40% oversized, but because the standard says that it's 5% below what it was new, you're gonna to have to do some work on it. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're talking about how you understand whether the pump's good or not, and uh, we'll uh, move into that. So why is there a curve? Why does this you know, relationship between the pressure and the flow end up giving us a curve? Well, because they both respond to speed differently. The uh, 
flow, as you can see, is directly proportional to the speed and the pressure is proportional to the square of the speed. So if, it, if they were both directly proportional, we'd have a straight line and we wouldn't get a curve, but we've got a curve and that curve should be the same. There are, uh, each time we test the pump uh, with you know, allowances for normal wear and tear. If the pump is used to wash down uh, the plant as sort of a housekeeping pump, you're gonna see a lot of wear and you're gonna use a lot of electricity while you're at it. But uh, you could be wearing your impeller down and you're gonna get you know, lower results each year and you can watch that. So since the affinity laws or since the, the pressure and the uh, flow uh, do not respond to speed the same way, when we run this test on a diesel and say it's rated for a certain amount of uh, flow at its rated pressure, at its rated RPM, then we run the test and our RPM is a little slow. Well, remember that if we bring the RPM down, we should expect to have not just a linear loss in flow, but a exponential loss in flow. So we're looking for that uh, change. Doing this is easy. These days, it's pretty much done by computers. You just kind of need to know what's going on so that you're not afraid to look at a fire pump test report. I, I know so many people who just kind of throw their hands up and don't know why or what they're looking at. So what data gets collected during a uh, fire pump test? The suction and flow, right? The suction and discharge pressures, the flow, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll talk about how we measure the flow the RPMs and the current. So these are just some of the basics. Uh, there's more that get looked at and I urge you to go back and look at NFPA 25 to do a complete full proper um, fire pump test. We're here to learn how to interpret the results of those tests. So you're gonna do this thing three times. You're gonna take the suction and discharge pressure, the flow, the RPM, and if it's an electric, the current, three times at zero, 100, and 150%. Okay, so it's kind of simple. It gets repetitive and you do this thing over and over. Well, what is this part about flow? We know that the pressure is the suction and discharge pressure. We get it, we should use calibrated gauges. If it's a nuclear power plant, you calibrate them before you use them and then you calibrate them after you use them. Uh, I haven't seen anybody in industry do that. We're lucky to see annual calibration stickers on gauges. We're really happy when we see contractors come in and their gauges are in a nice, protective case and that they're not just tossed in a cardboard box in the back of the pickup and that they you know stick that on our pump and tell us that that's what our performance is going to be measured with so uh, we like to see really nice equipment we like to see calibration stickers on it and then you know we'll let them use their uh, equipment to test it and that would be the pedo tubes that uh, and, the, and their gauges that they put in the suction and discharge if they come in and use your existing gauges that are already on your suction and discharge be careful uh, definitely pull them off you know first shut the root valves pull them off clean them out make sure that you're not going to get uh, some corrosion or debris pushed up into the Bordon tubes of those gauges. So uh, yeah, clean that out. Make sure you got a good water flow before you actually put pressure onto your existing pressure gauges. And then there's something called hose monsters. And we'll talk about what hose monsters are. Hose monsters are uh, a neat tool to help get uh, fire pump testing done. And uh, what, there's a hose monster in the back of this truck, okay? You can kind of see one down on the, uh, the, the or, <laughs> this is a station wagon. Believe it or not, this is what we tested fire pumps with in Baltimore uh, across the fleet of power plants. And uh, this that was probably close to 30 years ago that we did this. But uh, there's the, a couple of hose monsters in the back and some fire hose. You can see up in the front of the uh, station wagon there is the, the test header. That's where our guys went up and hooked up the hoses. I'm sure you're all pretty much familiar with that. If you've done a fire pump test or if you've been around it, we got to flow the water somewhere. And in the old, old days, they would flow it through underwriters' play pipes because they were very good at smoothing the stream and giving you a nice laminar uh, flow that you could measure on the way out. If you have a real turbulent flow as it comes out and it tries to get measured by a pitot tube, it doesn't work as well, okay? Because some of the pressure is going towards the tube, some of it's coming away and just gets all messed up. When all the water molecules are going in the right direction, same direction, then it's easier to measure that pressure coming out of that orifice. But uh, these guys are setting up to do the test. 
And then they'll run the pump and uh, this is obviously not the churn test because we're flowing water. So this is either the 100% uh, or the 150. And my guys back in Baltimore love to do five points. So they didn't just do zero, 100, and 150. They like to throw in like a 50%, a 75, and a 125. They just like to have a, a smoother curve. Uh, the code doesn't require it, but again, the code's not there to help us you know, make profits. It's not there to help us understand when it's time to replace the fire pump, other than if it's 5% below, you have to investigate it. Uh, you can learn a lot by uh, doing the test, right? So looking at a uh, suction pressure gauge, you can see that we've got to be able to also record negative pressures because uh, we can pull vacuums depending on the suction arrangement that we have. And uh, now let's talk about how we know that the information is good, okay? Well, let me get you over to a, another slide here, or the, uh, actually the form. And uh, we're gonna thank the folks at Hose Monster because they uh, have this up on their website. And uh, what, let's just start, it, it, many forms that you look at are gonna start off with about the same information. There's gonna be something that identifies the pump and then you are gonna know the manufacturer, the model, the serial number. But real important is this rated capacity, right? We're gonna to need to know the rated pressure at 100 PSI. So make sure that this information is available, the rated speed. Okay, if you get a fire pump test report and it doesn't have any of this information in it, then there's no way for anyone to analyze that the performance of the pump was proper. And you know that even though the contractor says it's good, the insurance engineer is going to know what they're looking at and they're going to come out and ask you to explain it. And you're probably going to have to have the contractor either explain it or perform a retest. But you'll see, you'll go through all the pumps and, you know, the, the controllers and you're going to make sure that you have all the information that you need to uh, be able to analyze the results. Okay. So, uh, Next thing is that we have to take that data that we collected. So we've, we've got, you know, physical information about the pump, but now we've taken performance information out there in the field, the flows and the pressures, right? So we have to account for pressure losses and friction losses, and we have to adjust the flows of the diesel. Remember, because the diesel can overspeed and it can underspeed. Electrics are generally tied to the grid and they're gonna be whatever the grid uh, frequency is. They're not gonna really be able to uh, change it. They're not gonna slow the grid down or, or, or boost it up. You do wanna look at current because they could be drawing more current at that rated speed. So uh, we're gonna watch the current. You know, we're gonna, over time, uh, we're gonna make sure that we don't have something changing. And then we're gonna compare the results of the test to the rated test, not just to last year's test and not to just the uh, greatest system demand. In fact, NFPA doesn't care if you look at the greatest system demand anymore. Uh, they just want to make sure that they're within 95% of what it did when it was originally installed. Uh, that's just how the, the cookie crumbled. Uh, we got the RPMs, right? And so when you're looking at uh, a performance test, the test results, you, let's just go across the top. There's the pressures, the streams, that's gonna be the flow. So we're measuring pressures and flows and, and this total totals the streams. Remember we had multiple hoses? That's because uh, the fire pumps generally can flow way more water than it can fit through one hose. You use three, four, five, six hoses, depending on the size of the hoses. Then you get your gallons per minute. This first line up here is at churn, right? So we're not going to have any flow. And then we're going to record the voltage. We're going to look at the uh, corrected flow and pressure. And again, this is corrected based on those affinity laws for the uh, difference in speed that uh, between the rated speed and what you actually determine when you were running it. So then let's take another look down here at this next uh, point. Uh, the next one is uh, we're looking at three, 300 or 3570 uh, RPM and looking at a net pressure of 116. And then we have two hoses. See, there's two streams that are flowing. 
And when you look at these, they're flowing through these hose monster devices, but you would have whatever the device, whether it was an orifice, you'd name what, what it's flowing through. What the pressure you measured with that pitot tube, okay, the new devices, the new measuring equipment, hose monster, pitot tube less uh, equipment. It's basically built in and you don't have to hold your hand in the stream and, and take a measurement like we all learned in uh, fire protection engineering a long time ago. So there's two streams here, you notice, and we've got a GPM 250 gallons a minute out of one hose, 267 gallons a minute out of the other. We total that all up. And then once we have, you know, our total flow, well, that happened to be 51% of the rating capacity. And then we come over and we correct it. Well, once we go through all these measurements at each of these uh, flows, then we can draw a curve. And with the curve, we can figure out, are we close to the manufacturer's curve or are we below it? You don't have to have a curve. You can just look at the points. You can just look at the three individual points. Is churn more than 5% below what the rating for churn was? Is the 100% performance more than 5% below the rating for the 100% of the pump flow. So you see, you, you just need to compare the numbers, but the, the, the software is going to draw curves. And you can quickly just look at the curve and see that, well, the, the rated is either above or below the, uh, the manufacturers or the performance, the performance was either above or below the uh, rating. Now, here's some other thoughts I want to pass along. Uh, the, just remember that the standards are written by the OEMs, people who sell fire pumps. They're written by the contractors who test them and repair them and rebuild them. They're written by the fire marshals. They're written by insurance company engineers. And occasionally the owners of the equipment get a, a voice or a say. So there's going to be different interests between the people that write the standard and the people that have to live with it or implement it. And one of the things I'll point out is that uh, the standard doesn't suggest that you track impeller wear. But I'll tell you, after having worked in facilities myself, that, you know, you, you don't necessarily have a budget to replace a fire pump when you know that it's 5% below its rating. So what you do is before you get to that point, you start trending each annual performance test. And you look to see, am I dropping half a percent per year, 1% per year, 2% per year, and you look to see, did it go up one year and down the next? So you're trying to get an idea of when you will hit that point where you are at 5% below. And it doesn't take anything but a spreadsheet. You just type in your historical numbers. You know, As you develop them, you'll, you'll have a way to trend it. Uh, the, the standard requires alignment checks, and this has nothing to do with interpreting fire pump test results, but I'll just say they're a waste of time. And, uh, you know, we'll know if our fire pump alignment is no good because we're running them every week. And if you start something with bad alignment, you'll find out pretty quick uh, it'll fail. So uh, with that, let me say thanks, and uh, please leave some comments. Please leave some questions. I hope this turns out great for you. Just remember that uh, the whole point of the, the test is to get the results. We have to be able to read and interpret the results, and the results have to either say the pump passed or that the pump failed. Thank you very much, and we'll see you on the next one.